And if you have your Bibles now, grab those and let's turn to the book of Nehemiah this morning. Nehemiah chapter 10 specifically is where we're going to be as we continue in our study of this book. Prayerfully moving through chapter 10 and chapter 11 today as we actually near the end of this book. Next week will be our final study in the book of Nehemiah. And then we will continue on into another book of the Bible the following week. But if you're taking notes today, the title for this message is Fresh Commitments, Fresh Commitments. And since it is the second to last study in the book of Nehemiah, it's only my second to last chance to tell you the breakdown and the themes that we find within the book of Nehemiah. You know well by now that Nehemiah breaks up into two distinct sections. Chapters 1 through 7, we see the rebuilding of a city. The physical walls of Jerusalem are built there by those who are residing in the land, led by our main character, Nehemiah, so as to secure themselves as a nation back in the place that God has for them. And then in Nehemiah chapter 8 through 13, We have the second section where it's not the rebuilding of a city, but the restoring of a people. There, as once the walls are rebuilt, we see the restoring and rebuilding of the people of God to right standing with God. And that is what we've been studying since we started chapter 8. There, by the reading and receiving of God's word, God's people have come back to the Lord. And we have seen themes play out throughout this book, and we'll continue to see them. That of rebuilding and restoring, of living on mission. The fact that burden, it precedes and accompanies mission. That as you're going to seek to go out for the Lord, there's going to be a burning burden for you to have to do that work. As well, we see that prayer, well, it's essential to living on mission. If you're going to do the will of the Lord, walk in the plan of God, it does us well to talk to Him. And so prayer is essential to living on mission. Mission, it also means work. Sometimes it means work that we're not uh, accustomed to, that we're not used to, maybe that we've never done before. Oftentimes it means hard work, but yet we know and have seen that God helps within the work as we walk on mission with him. And as well, we know that mission, it always brings opposition. That though we don't like to know, don't like to hear that, that is the truth. That as we step out for the Lord, we are going to see and feel opposition from the world around us, from our enemy and from our flesh. But yet what we know is that though mission brings opposition, God is with us every step of the way. And if you have been with us the past two weeks where we've been studying in the second section of the book of Nehemiah, we have been watching the people of God actively restoring their relationship to the Lord. We saw all the way back in chapter 8 as they gathered together in unity. The text says, as one man together, and they together requested that the word of God be brought and be read so that they, as God's people, could receive it. And we've seen that. We've seen them hear the word of God read to them there in the open square by Ezra. We have seen them receive the word as Ezra made provision for them to receive it. We've also seen them respond to the word of God. They responded to it with feasting and with fasting, with repentance, and revival is absolutely taking place there in Jerusalem. And last week, as we studied chapter 9, we saw that revival just continued in their hearts and lives as they listened to the Word of God, and as they also took a trip down memory lane. As they were there in Jerusalem, they took time to look back at the history of them as a people. As they were following the Lord, quite honestly, as they failed the Lord, as failure marked much of God's people and their history. But yet, despite their failure, they saw time and time again how God had been faithful. How God had worked and moved with them and had restored them time and time again through his word and through their surrendering to them. Much like they are doing currently in our text. And it is with that that we saw them last week make a fresh commitment to the Lord. They responded to the word, they received it, and so they were ready to make a fresh commitment to God. And it is that fresh commitment that we left with last week that we're going to see fleshed out this week in our text. The focus of our study today is between these two chapters, that fresh commitment of the people of God, and how it is going to be sealed, and how it's going to be set before them, and how they are going to commit to walk forward in it. Now, if you have read ahead there in chapter 10, like I tasked you with last week, you probably didn't make it past the first few verses because you realized the first 27 verse, verses are nothing but names. And some of these names we have seen in the book of Nehemiah already. Some of them we don't see anywhere else within the Bible. But what we're going to do so as to not, not uh, move through all those names, I'm going to leave those for you to read on your own because I know that you're absolutely going to. We're going to skip ahead to verses 28 and 29. We're going to read those to start out our message today. We're going to pray one more time, 
and then we will get into it. So if you are there, Nehemiah chapter 10, we are picking up in verse 28 where it says, now the rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, the Nethinim, and all of those who had separated themselves from the peoples of the lands to the law of God, their wives, their sons, and their daughters, everyone who had knowledge and understanding, these joined with their brethren, their nobles, and entered into a curse and an oath to walk in God's law, which was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe and do all the commandments of the Lord, our Lord, and his ordinances and his statutes. We're going to stop there and we're going to pray. Father, we thank you so much for this day. And God, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity and the invitation that we have from you, Lord, to worship, to meet with you, and to study your word. And God, also, too, we thank you for the promise within your word of the, of the Holy Spirit, the helper who is here right now to teach us the deep things of God. And so we ask that you would just be our teacher in this time, that you would lead us and you would guide us so that we as your people, Lord, could also freshly commit to you, freshly, Lord, surrender to you our lives to live for you according to your word in this world and show the world the truth. And Lord, we thank you for that. We pray expectantly that you would help us. And we pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, though we don't read or know the names of those listed here, what is represented in the first 27 verses and in the verses that we just read is really this joint effort of sorts where the people came together to sign and seal and walk in this fresh commitment. And all, of the scene, all through the scene here in Jerusalem, there has been this sense of real unity amongst the people. They have asked for God's word together. They have listened to it. They have received it. And they are here responding to it. And when it comes to the commitment, we see the people really step up to the plate, really put their money where their mouth is. And I love, if you do take the time to read the first 27 verses, what you see in the opening verse. It is the fact that Nehemiah, who is the governor there in the land of Jerusalem, as well as the leader and main character of the book of Nehemiah, well, he's the first one on the list to seal and to sign the fresh commitments. And all through that list, you're going to see leaders, nobles within the church and within the social circles of Jerusalem. They are the ones who sign and put their name to it. This is an amazing thing where it's not as if the nobles are looking at the people saying, yeah, you need to sign this because you messed up. We're good. See, we're in church. There was none of this po pointing the finger to who needed it and who didn't. There was this amazing joint effort, a unified collection of people who here are agreeing to commit to the Lord and walk with him. And that's really what we see in the verses that we opened up with. In verses 28 and 29, after this list of names, it says again, now the rest of the people, everyone with understanding, these joined their brethren, their nobles, and they entered into a curse and an oath to walk in God's law. That phrase with understanding is so important there. As we see that it points out that everyone within Jerusalem who had understanding, who basically knew what they were doing, well, they committed to the Lord. They committed to this fresh commitment, this fresh surrender to the Lord, no matter their age or their maturity level. If they got it, if they understood what was happening, the text indicates that they were all in, that they were ready to be continually unified and walk together in that covenant. And as they did, verse 29 says that they entered into a curse and an oath to walk in God's law. This idea of this curse and this oath, well, it, it puts weight to the commitment there, where they put themselves really on the chopping block, you could say, and they understand that to break the commitment with the Lord, well, it opens them up to consequences. As well, it sets them to the standard of following God's word in the areas that we're going to see them list out in just a moment. And they do so... Notice how verse 29 says, to walk in God's laws, which was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe and do all the commandments of the Lord, our Lord, and his ordinances and statutes. You see, they make this fresh commitment, this fresh stance there and surrender before the Lord, and they do so not ignorance of what God's word has to say to them, which is so key to their commitment to the Lord's. They understand the fact that they had spent so long reading and receiving the word of God, and that was not for, any, for nothing. They understand now that they are in a position of knowledge to know how they are to submit to the Lord, as well as the consequences that could befall them should they continue to deviate. They stand there in full knowledge of knowing what they as God's people are to do and what they're not to do. And they, having read, received, and now responding to the word of God, 
are saying, yes, we want to commit to that. We want to commit, knowing from experience as well, full well from the word of God, what could happen should we deviate. And I really love this example that they give us here. Because they give us example of what has been kind of a constant theme as we've started this second section of the book of Nehemiah, of needing to know the word so as to commit fully to the Lord. Of needing to know the word so as to be able to fully commit and walk with him. We see the people here not just flippantly saying, yes, God is better than what we've been doing, so let's walk with the Lord. No, they say we know full well from his word that he is better, so we need to walk with the Lord. And not only do we know that we need to walk with him, but we don't need to deviate from that truth because to do so is to bring consequences. Consequences that we have walked through, that our ancestors have walked through, and that we don't want to walk through anymore. And it all came from their knowledge of the word. They knew that they needed God's word to set the standard, to be the standard for their life. And so too, friends, is that the case for us? So too is it the case for us, and it may sound redundant as we've continued to say it time and time again over these past few weeks, but I'll say it forever that we need to be people of the Word of God, that we as the church, we need to know the Bible. We need to read the Bible knowing that it is God's words. Again, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, it is given by inspiration of God. It is literally God breathed. It is His Word, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that we as the people of God may be perfect, fully equipped for every good work. You see, as we read God's word, we become knowledgeable of God's heart because he wrote it. We become knowledgeable of the standard of how he wants us to live. And we also become knowledgeable of the consequences for when we deviate from God's word. And so we as God's people, as God's people here in Jerusalem in Nehemiah's day, we need to be in the word. We need to be people of the word, and we need to be reading our Bibles and praying every single day and reading all of the Bible. You know, we all have favorite parts of the Bible, right? Like Nehemiah, I've said over and over and over again, is my favorite book in the Bible. Like if it was up to me, we would start over after next week. That's exactly what would, what would happen. And if we needed to go to the New Testament for some, some more flavor, well, we would go to Colossians, and I would just teach that over and over again because Colossians is the best book in the New Testament. It's so good. And we need to be those, though we would love to stick with what we know, we need to be those that say, God, you lead the way because all of your word is good. You know, currently in my personal devotions, I started the book of James not too long ago because the Lord apparently wants to slap me in the face and give me a hug at the same time as the book of James does to us. And so currently I'm reading the book of James and the Lord is pointing out some things that I need to have dealt with in my heart and life. And if I would avoid that, well, I would never know that. I would continue on in the way that I'm going and never know that the Lord is wanting to speak to me on points within the word of God. And that's for all of us. We need to read our Bible, but not just read the parts that we like. We need to read all of the Bible. You're like, even Leviticus? Yes, even Leviticus. You're like, but it's gross. Yes, it is, but it's God's word. And it's amazing. And one day when we study Leviticus, you're gonna see just how awesome it is because right there with Nehemiah is Leviticus in my mind. Leviticus is awesome. But anyways, that's for another, that's for another study. We see the people of God here committing to the Lord, knowing the word of God is good and having heard it and received it, they're responding to it and they're letting it set the standard and so too should we. And to do that, we have to be in the word of God. We have to be reading our Bibles and praying every single day and taking it in, soaking it through and walking it out. And we see the people doing that. We see the people here as a joint whole and in unity committing themselves to the Lord. And then what the author does is he gives us insight into the areas of commitment throughout the rest of our text today as to where they commit and to how they're, and how they're going to walk with the Lord in these different areas. And we're going to notice as we move through these four areas that these are actually areas that the people of God here in Nehemiah's day, well, they've messed up in consistently throughout their history. And yet here, knowing God's standard, knowing that God is there with them and faithful to help them, they're saying, Lord, we want to commit to you in these areas. And we're going to see these four areas and note them out and see how they play out for us. Because in the same way that God wants to be involved with them, so too is he involved with us as well. And we see there a fresh commitment in the area first of relationships as we pick up there in verse 30 where it says that we would not give our daughters as wives to the peoples of the land, nor take their daughters for our sons. Very short, very simple. 
But this is an impactful verse considering the reality that all through the history of the nation of Israel, this is an area that they failed. We mentioned last week that God's people were moving themselves from the peoples of the land. It was significant in a move of repentance, not just here in Nehemiah's day, but also in Ezra's day. We see this consistently happening. In fact, we see this consistently happening all through Israel's history. Time and time again, they were called to live as God's people in the land he gave them, but they were to live as a witness. They weren't to live as a part of the land. They weren't to live as a part taking a hold of the lifestyle and the practices of the people of the land. They were supposed to live differently. However, they did anything but that, and they did so consistently. The Old Testament is full of God's people entering into wrong relationships, taking on the practices and the rituals of the peoples that lived around them, and suffering the consequences of doing so. By deviating from God's word, they brought condemnation and judgment upon themselves. And so here, they make a fresh commitment before the Lord in each other that they will no longer do that. And they won't give their daughters to the sons of the peoples of the lands. No will they take daughters for their sons from the peoples of the lands. They will live as God's people in the land as they were called to do so. They wanted to freshly commit to living in right relationships with the Lord and in relation to those around them. And they knew the Lord set the standard. So they follow his word for the relationships they would walk in and they commit to go that way together. And then the second way, the second place, area of commitment that they committed to was that of their rest. And really you could say along with their rest, with their work as well. There in verse 31, it says, and if the peoples of the land, if they brought wares or any grain to sell on the Sabbath day, Well, we would not buy it from them on the Sabbath or on a holy day, and we would forego the seventh year's produce and the exacting of every debt. Another consistent tripping point for the people of God, well, it was in the area of the Sabbath, the area of rest. You see, God commanded, and I do mean commanded his people to rest. Six days, they were to work. They were to work hard. But on the seventh day, they were supposed to take a break. They were supposed to take the day off. And then even further than that, every six years, they had a seventh year that they were to rest as well. They had this sabbatical year that God gave to them. And God commanded them that, hey, as you go into your land that I'm giving to you, then six days you work, then you rest, six years you work, and then on the seventh one you rest. And as such, you let the land rest and you let yourself see how faithful I'm going to be. And the people of God, they never did it once. They disobeyed in this area. In fact, for 490 years, you can mark it out, they disobeyed in this area. And so God said, all right, you've, you've not given me rest 490 years. I've sent prophets. I've sent my word. I've sent all warnings into exile. You're going for 70 years. The land is getting its rest. And the people of God realize this, and they know that this is a consistent tripping point. So freshly, they commit to the Lord that they wanted to commit to the Sabbath, And so in the way that it played out for them specifically is that, yes, they were to rest as well, but also, too, the peoples of the lands had gotten used to coming to them. They had gotten used to coming to them every single day of the week and selling and buying and doing business with them. And they're saying, hey, no longer are we going to do that. No longer if someone comes to us on the Sabbath, will we buy or will we sell? No, we'll tell them to come back tomorrow. They freshly committed to the command to rest and trust the Lord's. And so we've seen these two. And in verse 32, we see another area in which they commit, and that is with their resources. Pick up with me there. Where it says, also we made ordinances for ourselves to exact from ourselves yearly one third of a shekel for the service of the house of our God, for the showbread, for the regular grain offerings, for the regular burnt offerings of the Sabbaths, the new moons and the set feast, for the holy things, for the sin offerings to make atonement for Israel and all the work of the house of our God. And we cast lots among the priests, the Levites, and the people for bringing wood offering into the house of our God according to our fathers' houses at the appointed times year by year to burn on the altar of the Lord our God as it is written in the law. And we made ordinances to bring the first fruits of our ground and the first fruits of all the fruit of our trees year by year to the house of the Lord to bring the firstborn of our sons and our cattle as it is written in the law and the firstborn of our herds and our flocks to the house of our God, to the priests who minister in the house of our God to bring the first fruits of our dough, our offerings, the fruit from all kinds of trees, the new wine and oil to the priests, to the storerooms of the house of our God, and to bring the tithes of our land to the Levites. For the Levites should receive the tithes in all the farming communities. And the priests, the descendants of Aaron, shall be with the Levites when the Levites receive the tithes, and the Levites shall bring up a tenth 
of the, t- the, the tenth of the tithes, excuse me, to the house of our God, to the rooms of the storehouse. For the children of Israel and the children of Levi shall bring the offering of the grain of the new wine and oil to the storerooms, where the articles of the sanctuary are, where the priests who minister and the gatekeepers and the singers are, and we will not neglect the house of our God. They commit in this third area of the resources spanned over several different areas. And we see this in verses 32 and 33. We see them freshly commit to the reinstitution of what's known as the temple tax. This was set up in Exodus chapter 30, verse 13 through 16. And we see it practiced throughout all of the Old Testament, where if you were a Jewish male within the nation of Israel, every year you were required to pay this temple tax. And it wasn't a lot of money. It summed up to be about two days worth of, worth of work. And you would there pay, pay it to the temple annually for the upkeep of the temple. It was there to keep, keep the lights on, keep the walls painted, and keep it nice and, and a good facility. In verse 34, we also see this, and I love this. It's a very practical move where they cast lots, and really what they're doing is they're setting a schedule on when and how firewood is brought from who. Like, well, what I love is they're like, hey, the altar is always burning here at the, at the temple, and so it needs firewood. You guys have firewood, so guess what? You're going to provide said firewood, and the people commit to this. They commit to setting a schedule to bring in the firewood to the temple for the purpose of worship, and they commit to that. And then in verses 35 through 39, we see the offering of the people of God for the people to bring their tithe of the land. What is the first from their produce and livestock? They are to bring it there to, to the temple. They are to bring it and offer it so as, to, so as to pay to the Lord what is already the Lord's, but give back to him what he's given them to steward. And did you notice too that it says also that the priests overseeing the Levites, well, they were too as well to tithe as well. They were to tithe from the tithe. We see that mentioned there and they committed to it. And the last area, as we pick up in chapter 11, and as I'm going to leave you to read most of 11 on your own, we see something else that's really amazing that they commit to afresh. And that is for the Lord to lead them in their residence as well. I want you to pick up me in verse one. We're just going to read a couple of verses. Where it says, now the leaders of the people, they dwelt at Jerusalem. The rest of the people, they cast lots to bring one out of 10 to dwell in Jerusalem, the holy city. And nine tenths were to dwell in other cities. And the people blessed all the men who willingly offered themselves to dwell at Jerusalem. And like I said, I'm going to leave you to read the rest of chapter 11 on your own. And I encourage you to do so. We just simply don't have time today. But what we see here is the people of God are freshly committing to the Lord. They commit in a very special area, and that is that of their residence. You see, when God's people came out of Egypt, God said, hey, I'm going to lead you. And he did lead them. He led them through the wilderness for 40 years, and then he led Joshua, the leader, to lead the people into the promised land. And as he was leading them into the promised land, God said, okay, go in and conquer the lands, go in and conquer the peoples. And then when it comes to the distribution of the land for the tribes and the people, God called the shots. God made the call as to where the different people lived. And here they are freshly committing again to say, Lord, where you want us to be, that's where we want to be. How you want to lead us to our place and space of living, hey, that's what we want. They freshly committed to the Lord to go and to live where he would have them. And in so doing, they're committing to the Lord leading their lives, to the Lord leading them and showing them how he wanted them to go and where he wanted them to live. And we see all of these things. We see these areas of commitments that the people say, God, we want you to run this. We see the standard within your word. We see how you want to lead us. And God, we want to be led by you. And so they freshly commit in these areas that consistently trip them up. They're like, God, we know where we failed. We want to write it and we want to walk rightly with you. And they understand the standard. They understand how God wants to lead them by knowing his words, by listening to him and seeking to follow him according to his word. And my friends, the same opportunity is available to us to let the Lord lead us because his word speaks to us on all kinds of things of our life. And he wants to lead us through that. We have the opportunity, not just to look here at the the people of Israel being freshly committed to the Lord and led by him through his word, but we too have the opportunity to be led. 
understanding that God speaks to us even on the practical things of life. Like these things right here that we're speaking about, like they're not the big things that we expect when we want to hear from the Lord or want the Lord to lead us. Like we go to God, we're like, hey, lead me when it comes to a big business decision or to who I'm going to marry or to what I need to do in this next move. But we don't go to the Lord when it comes to just the day-to-day mundane things, though we should because God's word speaks clearly to us. Looking there at the four areas that the people committed to, we know that God's word speaks to how we as God's people should walk in relationship. How God's word calls for us to be mindful of who we align ourselves with. In the same way that he put his people in the land that they were in as a witness, so too are we called as God's people to be a witness in this world. And as such, we are to be in this world, but not of this world. Not aligning ourselves, not yoking ourselves, you could say, to the world's. Not walking and seeking to commit in ways that are deeper than just, you know, casual conversation. When it comes to a marriage, when it comes to a business dealing, when it comes to anything where we would seek to align, where compromise could happen, we are to say, no, 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 we will walk with the Lord and with his people. We see that in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 through 18, that Paul there is exhorting the church not to be unequally yoked, not to be in full agreement with unbelievers, but to walk as a witness in the world without capitulating to the world. God's word speaks on how we're to walk in relationships. He also speaks on how we're to walk in our rest. You could also say within our work, or you could boil it down to how do we utilize our time? Because God calls all of us not to waste our time, but to redeem it. As God's people, we are called to live life for the Lord, knowing that the time that we live in, well, it's the Lord's time. Everything that we do, every moment that we have, it is given to us by the Lord. So we're called not to waste it. We're called in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 and 16, to walk circumspectly, knowing not, not as fools, but wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. We're to walk, not ignorant of the day, not walk wasting time, but walk redeeming it for the Lord and seeking to show him that we're available for him to use. God wants to use us in our time, also in our resources. Realizing the same way that time belongs to the Lord and we're given time by the Lord, so too is everything that we are given the Lord's. All of our resources are given to us by the Lord. So we are called as God's people to give back to the Lord. And that means giving back to him our time, giving back to him our experience, giving back to him the physical resources he gives. We are called to give. We are called to tithe to our local church. Even our local church, we as the local church, we feel we're called to tithe. That's why we as Calvary Chapel, as an organization, we seek to tithe. Everything that comes in here, we seek to give so as to support missions and ministries here in this town and across the world because we believe that's what we're called to. We see that exemplified here with the tithe of the tithe. God's word speaks to us about how to utilize resources. Paul speaks of that in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9 about being a cheerful giver and giving faithfully. And even in our residence... You know, where you live is not by accident. In Paris, Texas, in the surrounding communities, all the way down to your house, it's not by accident where you live and who lives in your house. God has given you and myself a mission field where he's planted us. Wherever you are living right now, your neighbors, however far apart they may be, hey, guess what? That's your first mission field. That is where God has called you to be. And so what you should do, what I should do is look at our place of living as that way. Our residence, God wants to lead us there to pour into our families first and those that would come into our house and those around us. You know, perhaps you have a move coming up. And I just spoke about, you know, praying about a move. Hey, it's important to pray about a move all the way down to the house in the neighborhood that God's going to put you in because God will lead you. He will absolutely lead you with specificity as to where you are to be so that you can be the greatest impact for the kingdom of God where he plants you. We see that exemplified in Paul's life consistently as you read the New Testament. He prayed and the Lord led him. The Lord also told him where not to go at some times. You see, friends, God's word speaks to the things of our life, not just the big things that we say are big, not just the things that we see missionaries praying for and then getting sent across the world. God wants to speak and his word speaks to the everyday things of our life. You know, maybe it's not these four things right here that you need to surrender to the Lord and ask him to start taking. And you're wondering, okay, does God's word speak to it? Maybe it's your marriage or your future marriage or your singleness. Maybe it's your parenting. Maybe it's your business. Maybe it's your being a student. I don't know what it is, but God is faithful in his word to speak to us 
and show us how to walk in whatever stage of life that we're in so that we as God's people can freshly commit to him and can walk according to how he wants us to. And I wonder what it would look like if we as God's people would let God's word and the standard of his word be that which directs our life in any area that we have. And these four that we've listed out here, we know that God's word speaks to and wants to speak to us and lead us. But what about for you? Maybe you have that question in your mind. Who am I going to marry one day for you younger or, or even older in the room? I don't know, anyone. Or how, God, do you want me to walk in my singleness? How, God, do you want me to live as a student? How do you want me to walk in this business venture? Lord, what do you want me to do with this topic and this? I can tell you that the word of God, it speaks to it. I can tell you that the word of God speaks to how he wants us to speak, how he wants us to walk and talk just in our everyday lives. And if we as God's people would read and submit to that, and the world would see a church that is living differently than the world around and that is very inviting. Because as the world continues to move and continues to go and continues to suppress the truth of God's word, it is all the more important that we as God's people let God's word speak to us and lead us so that the world around us sees a different way to live, a better way to live that is blessed. That's not necessarily always easy, especially in the world we live in. You want to seek to walk in this world and live out in your marriage or in your singleness according to God's word, you're going to look different. That's just the reality. Perhaps you're going to be offensive even. But guess what? That is okay. It's okay as long as you are leading and living according to God's word and the standard that he sets up and you're committed to that then you are showing truth and you are showing what God intended. And so we need to know God's word so as to know how to do so and understand that it speaks to the things of our life. And church, it is up to us. And we are called today as they were committing their life there in the areas that they needed to, so too are we called to the same. And so too do we have a choice today on whether or not we will commit to the Lord and let his word be the authority, be the standard, be the direction in our lives that it wants to be, that God intended for it to be. And it's not just for us here together. Like here together right now, you're receiving the word. You've all sat still for like about 40 minutes. Good job on you for not getting up and leaving. But with the word being taught here, are you taking it in and allowing it to sink so as to apply it, or are you checking the box and saying, okay, well, I got my Sunday in. Apparently there's cake here, so praise the Lord. Then I'll go eat Mexican food. Or are you going to let the word of God do what it's supposed to be doing right now, cutting to the hearts and working through us that we could be doers of the word, not hearers only, and allowing it to lead our life. And I say that for me as much as I do for you, because I, I, I as well can get into the same rhythm of saying, okay, well, this is what we do on Sunday. I teach the Bible. I let it affect me and work through me, and then I teach it to you. But then I can also just close it up. I can be the student that studies for the test and then forgets everything afterwards. But what we need to do are be those that hear the word of God, receive it, and then respond to it, not just on Sunday, but on the next day as well. On Monday and Tuesday and every single day that God gives us to live, knowing that the day is given to us by the Lord to live for him, to serve him, to walk with him, and his word is there to lead us. And so are we together going to hear the word, respond to it, and live it out as a united whole? Or are we just going to not? The people here were united in responding to God's word, allowing it to be the standard. I pray that we would as well. I pray that we would as well, because if we do so scattered, then when or gathered, then when we're scattered, and the world will see something different, something that we are called to be, a different people, a light shining in this world. You know, in Matthew, we often trip it up by saying that Jesus says, you know, be a light or become a light. He says, you are the light. He says, you are the light of the world. You are the salt. And so it's not, hey, become this. It's, hey, be all that this entails. Shine brightly. And that happens, friends, as we know God's word and apply God's word to our life and commit freshly to it every single day and allow it to dictate our lives in every area of our life. And if we do that, and I pray that we would, the world will see Jesus 
and the world will seek to know him as we shine him. Let's pray.